Hello, before we start today's video, I want to let you know that Pale Blue Thoughts has completed two years of publishing videos. It has been an enriching journey trying to improve the scientific temper of my fellow human beings and have I succeeded? Well, certain recent events tell me that I still have a long way to go. I am referring to the recent frog wedding that was held in the state of Uttar Pradesh in India for bringing rains. Take a look at this press article. The people of Gorakhpur first did a yajna, then immersed their local MLA and municipal head in a mud bath and then married off two frogs in an effort to, well, bring rains. Of course, conducting yajnas or yajnas to bring rains and to cure the coronavirus is not new in India. But today we will look at the most important question. Why does it rain after a yajna? Welcome to Pale Blue Thoughts, the channel which promotes scientific temper and denounces pseudoscience. Oh sorry, I know that you are expecting the intro. But before I get into that, if you like these videos and learn something new, then please do share this video because I am sure you are seriously concerned about the lack of scientific temper in this country as I am and you want to improve it. So please share this video with your family and friends. Okay, see you at the other side of the intro. First, let us look at the question in a bit more detail. The question is, why does it rain after a yajna? Now, this is a typical example of a loaded question. I haven't released a video on it yet, but let me tell you what a loaded question is first. It is a fallacious question that puts the person who is being questioned in a disadvantageous and defensive position. For example, if you ask someone, have you stopped beating your wife, what answer would you give? If you said yes, that means you have been beating your wife and if you said no, then that means that you are continuing to beat your wife. You cannot answer this closed-ended question with a yes or a no. This is an example of a loaded question. Now let us come back to our original question. Why does it rain after a yajna? This presupposes that it always rains after a yajna. But is it really so? The actual question should be would it rain after a yajna? But the most critical question is to ask, does it rain because of the yajna? Then, based on the evidence, we can say yes or no. But if you ask the question, why does it rain after a yajna? It automatically assumes that it always rains after a yajna. That is fallacious and we will see why. Rains in India have a deep-seated history. India still depends to a large extent on rains. Rains and agriculture go hand in hand. Many parts of India still do not have canals, so for irrigation, our farmers have to depend upon rains. And when the rains fail, the farmers start to cry. Many still think that it is the gods that bring rain to them. And voila, one of them is doing yajyas and the other is marriage of frogs. Early Vedic scriptures also included animal sacrifices. However, thankfully, that is now not present. In fact, this is not the first time that this method has been tried in our country. The tiny village of Panyal in Trishur district of Kerala has hosted many yajyas called Adhiratrams dating back to the beginning of the 20th century. Adhiratrams were held in 1901, 1918, 1956, 1975 and more recently in 2011. Many of these are conducted and sponsored by state governments, all out of taxpayers' money of course. For instance, the Telangana government spent 15 crore for conducting a rain-making ritual in 2015. History tells us that this ancient Vedic ritual used to be conducted regularly between the 10th and 6th century BC. Even the Mahabharata claims that rains come as a result of Yajna. See this verse from chapter 3 verse 14 of the Bhagavad Gita. From food arise all beings, from rain food is produced, rains are produced by performance of Yajna and Yajna is born of karma or duty. According to the believers, the continuous burning of wood and combined with Clarified butter and other offerings made to the sacrificial fire releases a variety of chemical particles into the atmosphere which cause rain. However, according to science, that is not possible. Today we know why and how rains occur. The water droplets which make up clouds condense into one another, causing the droplets to grow. When these water droplets get too heavy to stay supported in the cloud, they fall to earth as rain. Simple third standard information. However, our ancients who got information through revelations did not understand this deep science. In fact, 
Today we can artificially produce rains by sprinkling silver iodide or dry ice on clouds using a method called cloud seeding. We can even stop rains as was done by the Chinese government during the Beijing Olympics in 2008. To ensure that the 2008 Summer Olympics were free of rain, the Beijing Weather Modification Office broke up clouds headed towards the capital and forcing them to drop rain on outlying areas instead. In fact, it is not just in India but even in the US there was a guy named Charles Hatfield who in 1915 proclaimed that he could make it rain in drought hit San Diego, California. He used his rainmaking apparatus which was a tall tower where he mixed a concoction of chemicals and sent vaporous fumes into the cloudless sky. The next day it started raining and it rained for a week. He tried to repeat his power in other areas with a mixture of success and failures. If you see the history, many cultures have practiced several methods of rainmaking. The rain dances performed by many Native American tribes and tribes in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa, Wu shamans in China and the ceremony called Aquilicium by ancient Romans are some examples. Enough of history. Let us get down to the question at hand. Isn't it convenient that these ceremonies are often conducted around the same time that rains are supposed to happen? Now in science, any theory or hypothesis has to be falsifiable. If rain after a yajna is true, how can we falsify it? Can anyone try conducting a yajna in the north of India during March-April when there is no chance of a rain? Or how about conducting this ceremony in the Thar desert? If it rains then, we can think there could be something in this. But no, no one would dare attempt that. These are often attempted at a time when it is likely to rain. Also, what about places like Mausin Ram in Meghalaya which receives the highest rainfall in India or Chirapunji in the same state which held the previous record? Are they conducting yajyas every day? If the reason for rain is yajya, how would you describe normal monsoons which happen without any yajyas? Also, like all prophecies, there is no specific time period associated with conducting this yajya. Can any priest who is doing this ritual be able to tell when exactly it would rain? while performing the yajna or after it or a day after or after a week. So while rain is not detected immediately after a yajna, at some stage or the other it may come. If it happens by random chance, this is taken as a hit. And how much rain is considered as a positive outcome? If it drizzles, can it be taken as evidence that the yajna worked or should it pour cats and dogs? What about too much rain that the area gets flooded? No. There are no such outcomes associated with these superstitions. People can even attribute falling of dewdrops from trees when a wind blows as a sign that it has rained. Then what about the locality? Shouldn't it rain at the very site for it to be considered a success? Can rains in another part of the village or another village or another part of the state or even another state be considered as a success measure? People often take such instances into their favor. Now let us see what is the actual reason why people succumb to such superstitions. The first one is correlation is often construed as causation. I have mentioned about this before. While causation and correlation can exist at the same time, correlation does not imply causation. Causation explicitly applies to cases where action A causes outcome B. On the other hand, the correlation is simply a relationship. Action A relates to action B. But one event doesn't necessarily cause the other event to happen. Correlation and causation are often confused because the human mind likes to find patterns even when they do not exist. So because it rained after a yajna does not necessarily mean that it was the yajna which caused it. For that, there has to be evidence presented that it was indeed the yajna which caused the rains and such evidence have never been scientifically proved. Secondly, there is the logical fallacy called post hoc ergo propter hoc or the post hoc fallacy. A occurred, then B occurred, therefore A caused B. The fallacy lies in a conclusion based solely on the order of events rather than taking into account other factors potentially responsible for the result that might rule out the connection. Rain could have happened as a result of the natural water cycle, but because a ritual was conducted, this is falsely equated that the yajna caused the rains other factors are totally ignored. The third reason is your confirmation bias. A confirmation bias involves favoring information that confirms your previously existing beliefs or biases. Confirmation bias is one example of how humans sometimes process information 
in an illogical biased manner especially with people who just tend to believe than think rationally when presented with something that you already believe in your brain would tend to take only those evidences that seem to reaffirm that belief and would ignore all those evidences which goes against that belief if you firmly believe that it would rain even one or two drops of water falling is enough for you to confirm your confirmation bias such a person would gladly ignore the many times when it has not rained after doing the yagya simple neurological science in action now let us assume for a second that there is a science behind the superstition let us for a second give in and say that yes yagyas have the power to cause rains let us for an experiment agree that all those wood being burned along with the ghee and other paraphernalia causes changes to the atmosphere and this causes condensation and it brings rain what can you confirm from that it just confirms that the burning of wood along with ghee and any other items has a tendency to cause clouds to condense and fall down as rain it is a simple physical process there is nothing supernatural magical mystical or spiritual energy involved in this even if you did the same thing without the chanting of mantras you should be able to replicate this process but no some irrational people need to involve the chanting of mantras which causes reverberations in this atmosphere and increases the positive energy and brings about quantum entanglement and bring in the supernatural element where it is not present just for horror of course you need something to justify the cause involved and the priest also have an axe to grind now coming to frog weddings this also has been practiced in many parts of the country there are records of this idiotic superstition from varanasi udupi assam rajasthan tamil nadu tripura madhya pradesh and more recently gorakhpur in up the logic behind this is entirely bizarre when it rains the frogs croak when frogs croak it means the rains are just a few days away the frogs apparently have a sixth sense for detecting impending rains but when frogs don't croak before the start of the rains it is time to worry in reality frogs often croak in order to attract females to mate and their mating season just happens to coincide with the arrival of wet weather in tropical climates and this often is misconstrued as frogs bringing rains the marriage functions are very much similar to human marriages it includes identification of an adult male and a female frog then their gotras or castes are verified how don't even ask me even frogs can't escape the caste system in india next relatives of the bride go to the groom's house and consult about a mutually agreeable date for the wedding it is a serious process and all of the necessary precautions are undertaken all of the planetary constellations are checked and the best possible date is identified once the date is finalized then both the partners send out invitations to their relatives relatives here do not mean other frogs of the well it is the other villagers that are being invited meanwhile the bride is made ready for the wedding turmeric powder or haldi is applied on her body and is often made to wear bridal clothes on the fateful day at the appointed hour the groom along with his marriage party comes to the bride's place then there is the usual band baja barat that is synonymous with a big fat indian wedding even the saath feras or the seven ceremonial circling of the fire is also conducted of course the frogs are not going to go around in circles holding hands the priest often holds them and circles the fire mantras are chanted and garlands are exchanged which concludes the wedlock any indian marriage is incomplete without a grand feast frog marriages are always accompanied by a feast where the entire locality or village is invited everyone comes and has a meal to their heart's content i wonder what the groom and bride must be thinking at this point of time would they feel threatened would they be in pain because of all the noise around them or would they be wondering what is wrong with these humans now what happens after their marriage would they live happily ever after <sighs> alas no after the marriage is over both the creatures go back to their respective ponds lakes or wells happy that their lives were spared it is a short lived marriage for them and the foolish villagers go back to their homes in the hope that it would rain soon because of the great deed that they just did in fact in 2019 just 2 months after a frog wedding was conducted in bhopal madhya pradesh the villagers 
forced two frogs to get divorced after heavy rains slashed across the state. A proper separation ceremony was conducted at a temple and the two frogs were then released into a vessel filled with water amid chanting of mantras. How ridiculous can people get in this country? I have seen some statements from Vedic scholars and some saffron ministers that conducting yagyas increases the oxygen content in the atmosphere. Pure hogwash. Anything that burns consumes oxygen and does not generate oxygen. The yagya process itself produces much more carbon monoxide than it takes out of the air. Ask any of the people who are conducting these rituals the explanation of the process and their answer would be that it is written in the Vedic texts. All that is written in books are not true as we have seen in many instances. I had done a video on the calculation of sun earth distance in the Hanuman Chalisa which you can watch after this if you haven't already. So to sum up, this is just another superstition that needs to be rooted out of this country. If you have a counter argument, you are free to conduct a yagya at a time and place where it is not likely to rain around that time and also specify the exact time that it is going to rain, the exact amount of rainfall and the exact locality where it is going to rain and bring in the evidence. Of course, no one is going to be bold enough to be specific like signs and put their money where the mouth is. As for the poor frogs, I can only sympathize with them for the stupid beliefs of some fellow humans. I hope you like this episode. If so, please don't forget to share this so that we can try and change the viewpoints of at least a few people and bring about a change in the scientific temper and rationality of people in our country. I will be back with more scientific content. Until then, it's bye-bye from Pale Blue Thoughts.